Well, hello there, it's Keith here, and this is lesson nine of the Photon series of my 65 Auto Assembly programming tutorials. And today we're looking at the Super Nintendo. Um, this series, we're basically creating this Photon game. It's a little Tron clone. So we have a little line that we have to make our opponent crash into. And if we do that, then we win. Now, this isn't a very interesting game, and it's not really worthy of a system like the Super Nintendo, but it's a fun little practice for us. And it's also trying to make an interesting experiment. And that's, um, we've got these systems that are really designed to do tiles and sprites and we're drawing pixels and lines on them so we're, we're manipulating them to work like a bitmap screen of a more classic system like the Spectrums and the Amstrad CPTs and things like that. So that's what we're going to be looking at today and the Super Nintendo posed an especially large challenge for this. What we're basically doing is we're mapping the screen to be full of different tiles and then we're changing those tiles, the pixel data of those tiles, to simulate our pixel screen. The problem with the Super Nintendo is we can only write the pattern data during V blank when the screen's not drawing. Now, this wouldn't be so bad um, if we were using the 65A16 processor properly, but in my tutorials, um, I have to admit, I'm not using it. I'm using it in 6502 mode, and this means we've got a limit of 64K of addressable memory, and this means we've got a addressable amount of memory of about um, 8K, I think it is. It's not enough. That's how much it is. And um, we need 16K to change all of the tiles in four color mode. So we had to do a workaround for this. Now, just before we go to the code and discuss all of the things I've had to do to get this game to work properly, um, I do want to just show you some features of the game that we will see in the code. Now, firstly, whenever I press a direction, if I hold left, which I'm doing now, I only turn once. You have to release and press again and again for the turning to continue. That's so we don't crash into stuff. The other thing is if we hold down the fire button, we will move faster. And this is so we can catch up with the enemy and give us some, um, some challenge and some fun. So th those are some features of the game that I think you need to know about to understand the code. Okay, so let's go over to our example and let's take a look. So this, this game does work in 6502 mode. Um, uh, and we need to gain some access to the extra memory somehow to have enough memory for our game to be able to store a buffer of the entire VRAM that we need to change the pixels. And we're using these weird ports here, 2180 to 2183 to do this. Now these access something known as the WRAM and this is the large bank of memory that's available to us on the um, Super Nintendo. Now the memory addresses go from 7E quadruple zero to 7F quadruple zero. Now this is outside of the usual 16-bit range. These, this is the sort of physical memory addresses. Now the regular range 1 to 2000 is actually part of this. That would be for, from 7E quadruple zero to 7E one triple F effectively. Um, now we're actually going to use some more of that. We're going to use hexadecimal 4000 bytes and we're going to use those from 2 triple zero onwards. Now we're going to address those using these ports here. Now we can specify a byte of this memory address by writing the three byte address, a 24 bit address effectively, um, to these ports here and that will select the address and then we can either read or write from this port here, 2180, and that will read or write to that memory and it automatically increments, which is good for us if we want to read a sequence of bytes and it's bad for us if we want to read from this address and then write back to it. Uh, we want to do both. So it's going to cause us some problems sometimes and, and help us out in other times. But that's how we're getting around this. As I say, ideally you'd use 65816 mode if you were going to do this, but um, these tutorials don't. These are 6502 tutorials. I'm going to cover the 65816 next year, but um, I, I'm, I'm writing multi-platform tutorials and the 6502 is more popular, so what are you going to do? I'm, I'm sorry, that's um, it's a limitation of my time and um, my commitment to the Super Nintendo, really. But we're going to get the game working anyway, and it's just such a simple game, it doesn't really make any difference. So I think we've come up with a good result anyway. Now, we're going to need to use a bank of memory to do this. We're also going to need to write the data from our buffer in RAM to VRAM in sections. We can only write during the V blank NMI, but um, it's actually too much memory. We, we can only transfer a quarter to each V blank, even with the DMA. It's just not fast enough. So we've got this buffer bank variable in the zero page, which is going to be which quarter of the screen we're transferring next. We've got our screen size definitions here. 256 by 224 is the workable area of the screen. And um, we've only got four colors, unfortunately. Um, even using an MRA V blank um, DMA, it, we can only transfer a quarter of the screen. So we're going to use four color mode. Otherwise, we'd only be able to transfer an eighth of the screen. So um, we're compromising there. 
Now we've got some setup here. This is mostly the same as we've seen before. The only difference is we are using a different screen mode. We're using the four color tile map here this time. Um, but apart from that, this is all the same. So this is setting up our screen, setting up the scroll position, and then we're filling the tile map with consecutive tiles. We don't change the, the tile map, we change the pixel data of the tiles, and every tile in the visible screen is going to be using a different tile number. We start at tile zero, so we go zero, one, two, three, four, and then 32 onwards, and so on, and as the screen goes down. We're gonna change those tiles later on. Here we're turning on the tile screen, here we're turning on the interrupts and here we're setting up our buffer bank that we're going to write the next section to with the DMA. Okay, here we're clearing our game memory and here we're starting the game. Now we've got this thing called the tick in the main loop and the tick is um, relating to the boost mode when you hold down fire to move faster. If boost mode is on then we will update every tick, if boost mode off we'll move every other, other tick and that's how we make the game faster. We've also got a delay here, the delay is slightly slower if boost mode is on because we have to uh, update the counter in the corner of the screen and that takes some time. So we've got a compensation there for that. Then we're reading in the joystick and we are going to store any changes to the joystick direction in ZD. If the joystick is not got any directions pressed then we're clearing the key timeout and that's how we have that thing where you have to release a direction and press it again to move in the same direction again. That's what's going on there and that's the delay loop. So that's the loop that slows down our game. If you want the game to be faster, change these here. If you want it to be slower, make them higher, I guess. So there we go. And here is the start of our processing for the directions. We check the key timeout. If the key timeout is not zero, then the player never released the direction. So we're gonna ignore whatever they're doing at the moment. And then it, what we're doing is we're checking each of the directions, left and right. Now we set the zero page entry IX to the player X acceleration in memory. And that's because the set player direction function will update the accelerations with the correct ones for the current direction. The directions work in 90 degree increments, north, south, east, west type. And um, we just increment and decrement the player direction accordingly. And then set player direction does all of the rest of the work of updating the accelerations for that direction. We update the key timeout, setting it to one, which means any new presses will be ignored until the player releases the key. Then we check the fire button. If fire is pressed, we check the boost power. If the boost power is not zero, we've still got some boost left. And so we set boost to zero, which turns it on. The rest of the boosting, so to speak, and the decrementing of the boost counter is all in the handle player routine. And that's the collision direction and things like that as well. Handle CPU is the same for the CPU, updating the CPU logic. It's all in the multi-platform code, which is very good. That's the main loop, that's all of it, it's the entire thing. So it's nice short and that means this game's relatively easy to port to, to a new system. It's usually very easy but this system was a bit of a pain. So, um, so there we go. Now let's start by discussing the interrupt handler, the NMI. Here it is, an unmaskable interrupt handler. So this runs during VBlank. Um, we're using the DMA memory transfer here. This will copy a bank of memory into VRAM. Um, it's the fastest way of doing things, but it's still not fast enough, it seems. So uh, there we go. So we're specifying all of the settings here. We're specifying the VRAM destination here, memory address 1000, which is the pattern definitions. We are adding the buffer bank, which is the offset for the quarter that we're gonna transfer this time. Um, this is in words, this is in VRAM addresses. The VRAM, each address contains two bytes. So um, that, that you're gonna see that discrepancy. So we're setting the destination here. We're setting the source here, which is in the physical address, 7E quadruple zero onwards. Now our buffer starts at 7E two triple zero and we need to add the buffer bank, but the buffer bank is the word location in VRAM and we need a byte location. So we're rotating that to the left once here and then we're adding that here and that will be the start of the area that we need to copy this time. We're setting the number of bytes to copy here, in bytes this time. So we have hexadecimal 1000 bytes and we are storing that there. We're then starting the transfer here and then we're updating the buffer bank, adding hexadecimal eight here. And we are just um, wrapping that around. So there's gonna be four transfers and then it's gonna wrap around to zero again. Storing that for the next time. And then we're just resetting the, um, the in auto increment of the VRAM addresses here for the rest of our code to work normally. That's the um, interrupt handler, bit of a pain there, but that's what we had to do. Okay, so that's the only bit that's actually updating VRAM. The rest of our code is actually working on the buffer 
in in um, in this extended memory, the WRAM as it's called. So this is our PSET command. Now on some screens we've got 320 pixels wide, in which case our X coordinate will be a combination of the accumulator and the B register, the B0 page entry, sorry, um, it's a port of Z80 code, I keep calling it a B register. So we've got um, zero page entry BC as our X, Y coordinate and the color is in D. Now each tile is eight pixels wide and um, because of the bit planes, each byte contains eight pixels. So we are going to use a mask to work out which bit of that byte we will need to change depending on the bottom three bits of the X coordinate. So zero to seven will be a pixel mask from these here. And um, so we're selecting one of those and then we're pushing that onto the stack for later. Next, we're using calc VRAM address, slightly mistitled on this system. It really should be um, calculate VRAM buffer address maybe, but we're gonna have a look at that in just a moment. That's calculating the HL address of the position within WRAM of the pixel that we want to change to update the correct pattern for that location of the screen. So we are calculating that here, and then we're reading in two bit planes. Now, um, we're gonna change those, and we, that's gonna change the color. So we load those in, and then we write the address that we calculated here. Now, I should point out that this function is actually selecting the address here. We select the low byte here with Z2181, the mid byte with 2182, and the high byte with 2183 here. Now these addresses are always relative to the start of WRAM, so the top byte isn't 7E here, it's actually zero, you can see. So slightly surprising maybe, but that's the way this function works. So we selected that here when we read in, but when we read in, it automatically increments, so we're now pointing at the wrong address, and we want to change those two bytes that we just read in to the new values. So we reset the address again by writing the L and H in the blank, zero byte to these three locations here, and then we're ready to write back. Now, we got the mask for the pixel we want to change here, and we now store that in zero page entry B. We then flip the bits, and we store it in zero page entry C, and this will be the mask for the seven pixels we want to keep. Now, what we do next is we take the pixel we read in from the screen just here, or from the buffer of the screen rather, and we're now going to mask and keep the pixels we want to leave alone, the seven that we don't want to change. We then take one bit from our color, and if that's a zero, then we just write that value straight back to the buffer. If it's a one though, we all in the pixel mask for the color we want to change. That does bit plane zero, we then do bit plane one here. Now, if you were working in 16 colors, you'd have to do this whole thing again. You'd have to read in more pixels from the math, from the um, pattern data here. You'd have to then order them with the next two bit planes here. It'd be a lot longer. As I say, um, it, it wasn't the extra length of code that was the problem. It was that it would actually produce a worse result because you would have to transfer less data during each VBlank and that would mean the screen would update more slowly. So in this case, for this system, I've only used four colors. The game looks fine in four colors. It's just the Super Nintendo is capable of 16, of course. So a little bit of a limitation there. So anyway, that's the updating of pixels there. The point command tests a pixel, basically the same code, calculating the pixel mask, reading in from video RAM here, reading the two bytes that make up the two bit planes, and then testing the pixels of the bit plane and setting ZD accordingly here. And that will return the color for the pixel that's been tested on the screen. Now, the bulk of the other work, of course, is being done by this calc VRAM function, which is calculating a position within the buffer of the pixels. Now, the base of our VRAM is at 7200 here, so we're loading HL with 2000 here, and then we're going to calculate the memory address for the pixel within the patterns that we could change. So what we're doing here is we're ignoring the bottom three bits because there's eight pixels per um, line of each of the pattern. So we're ignoring those. We're taking these bits here and we're effectively multiplying them by 16 because there's eight lines per tile and two bytes per line. So if we're on this tile, then we're at position zero. But if we're at the next tile along, we're at position 16 effectively. That's why we're doing that. We're then taking the bottom three bits of the Y position, zero to seven, and we're multiplying that by two because there's two bit planes per line within a tile. Next, what we're doing is we're taking the top five bits, and this is effectively working out which horizontal tile the Y position is in. Now, each tile is, of course, 
eight lines tall. Each line is two bytes, and there are 32 light tiles on each line. So we're doing 32 times eight times two, which is 512. We're doing that effectively by bit shifts, and that we're adding that to our cumulative running address. And now we've got the address of the line within the tile of the pixel we want to change. So we write the low address to 2181, the mid address to 2182, and a zero to 2183, and that will select the memory address within the WRAM that we want to change, and that's what's doing the work for us. The final thing we've got here is a clear screen routine. So this is just selecting the start of the data, selecting the number of bytes, hexadecimal 4000, and repeating writing zeros to that address. Remember, every read or write to the WM data port at 2180 will auto increment that port. So uh, as I say, in this case, that helps us out. But when we're reading and writing to and from the same byte, we need to reset it after the reads because the writes will no longer point to the same position. Now, the rest of the code we've got in this, fill area with tiles, prepare VRAM rate for VBlank. Um, this is all the same, and in read control jewels even, this is all the same as in the simple series and in YQuest. So if you don't know how those work, please take a look at the simple series, my example on bitmap drawing using the tarmap, um, joystick reading using the tarmap in simple series, and YQuest did all of this for another game as well. So if you want to see more on how that works, please take a look at those so I don't have to explain them again. Anyway, that's all we are covering today. If you'd like this and you want to see more, please hit the like button. If you like the videos, YouTube recommends them to more people and maybe they'll like them as well. And if you subscribe, it um, helps me out. It keeps my motivation high to keep working on these systems and writing the same game over and over again on all these different systems that people maybe enjoy. And finally, of course, you can go to my website, download the source code, compile this, and hopefully make a better game of it. I'm sure you could do so. Uh, I'm not claiming this is some amazing game, but if you can make any use of the source code, just go ahead and do it. Um, you're totally welcome to do it. That's the point of me releasing these tutorials. Anyway, thanks for watching today, and goodbye.